So the subject of my uh, research, this particular research, has to do with one of the contexts in which ceramics were used. And that's called the symposium. And the symposium is an all-male drinking event. And this is something that's very unique to Greek culture. It has some ideas brought in from others, but it's unique to Greek culture in that it's a, t a time where a small group of men get together, usually at the home of a friend, and the focus is on drinking. And so they may have had some food earlier, but the focus is on drinking together. And the drinking together forms bonds. In the, the Iron Age, we have examples of grave markers that are in the form of the vessel, the, the pot, the, the uh, mixing bowl that was used to mix wine and water. So this example here is actually over three feet tall. It was used to mark a grave and it shows how important the ability to host a symposium was for people at this time. At this time in the Iron Age, uh, the types of cups they used were pretty uh, unexciting. They were uh, two-handled affairs with sort of flat feet. Nothing very exciting. They got some decoration, but nothing, nothing too elaborate. Things really start to become interesting instead around the year 600. And it's at this time that in Athens, the pottery industry starts to come into its own. And so we start to see a kind of cup form that's going to carry on for over 200 years. This is a broad bowl with a stemmed foot. So this kind of stemmed foot, which we also call a kylix, this is a kind of shape that becomes the type, this quintessential shape associated with the symposium for many hundreds of years. At the beginning, this uh, shape stays uh, introduced, gets introduced into Athens, and it's popular for about 50 years. Then around the middle of the 6th century, so around 550 BC, we start to get a really amazing series of new designs, cup designs. And these cups come on feverishly, feverishly at this time. We get a whole sequence of innovations that happen one right after another. So for example, we get the Sienna cup, is one of the earliest variety of these. You can see it still has the stemmed uh, foot and the broad bowl. But then we get some very elegant relatives like this tall lip cup with a very delicate rim on it. And then its neighbor or its brother, the band cup, and you can see why we call it a band cup because it has a decorative band around the center of it. And then finally here's another example called a droop cup which has some of the same features but has a different decorative design. And it's during the Peloponnesian War that we see a really interesting development on the, uh, with drinking cups. And that, I've described this development as one of pseudo-luxury. In other words, cups become very metallic in their style. So these are ceramic cups that are imitating features of metal forms. So, for example, one of the things that happens is that we get a pure black, a whole solidly black. Some still have decoration, of figural decoration, but mainly just solid black, mirror-like surface that reflects in the way that metal or silver would reflect. And then on the interior, as you see here, you see uh, decoration that's stamped and incised underneath that glaze as if you had um, chasing or embossing on a, um, an actual metal vessel. At this time when metalware was becoming um, more important to the potters of Athens, another form was developed at this same time. It's called acantharos. And acantharos is a very odd form in ceramic. Instead, what it is is emulating a metal form very directly. And the one, one form of the acantharos, the earlier form, has these upswung fancy handles that come up and turn in. These are very delicate affairs that don't do well in ceramic. We can see that the potters quickly replaced them with a more practical kind of loop handle. These are very, very sturdy and in fact survive very well. The handles alone survive very well in the archaeological record.